Well, welcome to episode 92 of 10 Minute Record Reviews. And today we're going to talk about Bachman Turner Overdrive's eponymous 1973 release, Bachman Turner Overdrive, which I have here. Strangely, what I have, despite this being a Canadian vlog, is the first UK pressing of this album with the distinctive Gears logo. The history of BTO is very much intertwined with the history of Randy Bachman. He was born in Winnipeg, played violin as a kid. He, like a lot of kids in the 1950s and early 60s, had been inspired by seeing Elvis play guitar. He's got an aptitude, he can't read music, but he has a real capacity to pick up tunes and to write tunes as well. Randy's music career begins to take shape in and around 1960, when he and another guy from Winnipeg who's a singer, a guy called Chad Allen, form a band called Allen the Silvertones. By 1962, they rebrand themselves as Chad Allen and the Expressions, and there were other versions of that name as well. And then in 1965, they formed the Guess Who. After a few albums which performed reasonably well in Canada, hit a big worldwide in 1969 with These Eyes, which Randy wrote with Burton Cummings, the lead singer of the band. Randy sticks around for three albums at the peak of their fame, including American Woman from 1970, the title track of which goes to number one in the States. At the peak of all of that, Randy walks away from the Guess Who. A variety of reasons for this, some of which he's talked about, some of which others have suggested, typically having to do with the lifestyle of the band. Plus, Randy had his own health issues as well, which were kind of exacerbated by the road lifestyle, so he walks away from the band in 1970. He then forms in 1971 a band with his old bandmate Chad Allen from Winnipeg called Brave Belt, which was basically at that time a country rock outfit. He brings in his youngest brother Rob Backman on drums. Robbie had been basically gigging around Winnipeg and had not really done much of note. In fact, most of his career is essentially associated to being in bands run by his older brother Randy. They're signed by Reprise in 1971. They release a debut album, which as I mentioned is basically a country rock album. And pretty soon after that, Fred Turner, also a Winnipegger, joins on bass and vocals, bringing a whole other kind of a sound, what Randy has termed in the past a Harley Davidson sound, to the singing. He was recommended by Neil Young. Like a lot of these guys, he'd played in and around the Winnipeg music scene, which was really quite phenomenal back in the day probably the most vibrant musical scene in Canada in the late 1960s. He'd played in a band called Pink Plum, he'd played in some cover bands. Basically, this is his first big break. They're still playing country rock, despite the essentially the tension and sound between Turner and Allen. Eventually, Allen leaves. At this point, Brave Belt is the two Bachman brothers plus Fred Turner. So Randy, who had already been to the top of the music world with the Guess Who, is now reforming a band with a bunch of other guys who have really never tasted that kind of success. Famously, in Thunder Bay, they play a gig, promoter sacks them because the audience reaction was not very good, comes back on hands and knees a day or so later because the headliner who was expected to come into town had bailed out in them, says, can you please play basically a cover gig and play a bunch of rock songs? They say, sure, and they basically invent their heavier sound right there on stage and never really look back. And that heavy sound starts to emerge in their next album, Brave Belt 2. So they tour heavily to support Brave Belt 2. Tim Backman comes in to add a second guitar to Randy's guitar after Chad Allen departs but they're not really making much headway. The album is not selling, and eventually their record label, Reprise, drops them. So they've got problems. They meet a guy called Bruce Allen, who becomes their manager. Allen, of course, would go on to manage all kinds of people. He advises them to move to Vancouver. They cut a demo, which is basically going to be the Brave Belt 3 album, and Randy's shopping it around. He shops it to all the labels. They all turn him down, you know, classic story, until a guy called Charlie Fatch, who's an A&R guy at Mercury Records in Chicago, sees this reel lying around, recognizes Randy's name on the reel, gives it a spin, hears, give me your money, please, likes it, gets hold of Randy, and signs him basically on the strength of that song. He suggests to them, and this is something which Bruce Allen also was in favor of, a name change. They're looking at magazines while they're out on tour somewhere and they see a trucker magazine that's called Overdrive and they figure this is so evocative of our sound so they added that to their name. They're also at this time amusingly when they'd moved to Vancouver living above a muffler shop which to me I hope that story is true because to me it's just absolutely perfect. They also design or at least Rob Backman designs this famous gear logo which is then sculpted by a guy called the Parviz Sadigian, about whom the internet has nothing to say, but this is his name. And I have to say that when I first started listening to BTO in 1974 as a nine-year-old, this logo was incredibly evocative for me and I think one of the great pieces of marketing genius in rock and roll history. 
Anyway, the album gets recorded, basically the songs on the demo. They get asked to punch up the guitars and give it a bit of a grittier sound. It's produced by Randy and the band, and strangely, given that Randy has some real pop sensibilities and have been involved in a number of records with the Guess Who with really superb production in my view, the production on this album, I think, is pretty sloppy. It is very bottom heavy, which is good because this is a heavy rock band, but it lacks any sense of, of sparkle or energy in the higher end, and it's characterized by a lot of tunes that unfortunately, whatever their merits, are produced to sound like what uh, I think one reviewer called sludgy workouts, and that's basically a pretty accurate description of a lot of the tunes in this album, but not all of them. Another peculiar decision is the degree to which Fred Turner is front and center in this album. I can understand that the band felt their fortunes had turned around when Fred became more central to the sound of the band and when his style of music became more central to the sound of the band. But it is possible to have too much of a good thing and this is certainly the case here. The album in general really needed the pop know-how of Randy and there's some key points here where it doesn't really get it, which is unfortunate. So side one starts with Give Me Your Money Please. This is a Fred Turner vehicle and one of the better ones on the album. It's a pretty simple three chord tune. You could almost say it's like ACDC with a little bit of a country tinge. It's got a pedal steel guitar, which is a catchy little additional aspect to the song. It's got Fred's kind of biker vocals. It has a superb outro solo from Randy. And even if this song is a little bass heavy, still lots of pop appeal here. This song actually did reasonably well relative to the other singles which were released. And that's followed by Hold Back the Water, which is basically a song about the weather. It's got Randy's great twangy Fender sound. His brother Rob's drumming is pretty basic here, as it is largely through the album. Remember the guy was 18 when he got the Brave Belt gig? He's not much older here, and he was not that experienced a musician, certainly at a high level, before joining the band. You can make a good case that there are basically two innovative musicians here on this album, Randy and Fred, and two others who are basically making up weight. Rob on drums and Tim on guitar. And it isn't really until Blair Thornton comes in that the band's catalog begins to exhibit high quality musicianship as a rule. Here, there are some pretty plotting moments. Beyond the issues with the drumming, there are some nice solos here, but this song, for my money, goes on a little too long. Then we're on to Blue Collar, which is the other song in this album which actually had some legs as a single and which still gets airplay many years later. This is written by Fred Turner. It's actually quite distinct from a lot of the other stuff that he writes in this album. It's much more characteristic of the more nuanced stuff that would happen in 74, 75, and 76 for this band. It's got congas. It's got the first outing on a BTO record of Randy's kind of jazzy guitar style. There's other examples of that here as well. Fred sings in quite a restrained way. It's also an interesting lyric. The song is basically about social class. It's got a great wah-wah solo as well by Randy that fits really well. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. You've got the jazz, you've got the social class lyrics, you've got the wah-wah guitar, you've got this gentle emotional lyric. Lots of complexity, lots of interest, and at this point, two of the three songs have been excellent. Unfortunately, that's where the quality starts to dry up. The last song on side one is Little Gandy Dancer. Fred sings, kind of doing a Little Richard kind of a thing, if that makes any sense. The drumming, again, is problematic. The song picks up when Rob Backman abandons the kind of heavy-handed figure that he was playing in the early part of the song, and the latter part of the song is actually reminiscent of the Stones, but that's not really enough to redeem the song. This is basically meh. Side 2 begins with an unusual song called Stayed Awake All Night. This is a song which runs out of ideas really early on. It's Randy's first vocal outing, which is a nice change from Fred, but pretty soon what you start to get is this almost shrieked chorus about staying awake all night, which just repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats, and this is a song which you kind of want to end a couple of minutes before it actually does. Then we have Tim Bachman's first outing as a songwriter, Down and Out Man. Overall, not a bad effort at sort of country boogie rock. The main riff's not too bad, but again, not super memorable. In the case of Tim Bachman, not really a showcase for tons of talent. Then we have another Randy song, Don't Get Yourself in Trouble. So this starts off with a great riff, the kind of thing that they would write in their sleep by about 1975. But still, there was some uncertainty around the songwriting. There are great parts of the song, but it doesn't really hang together. Fred and Randy alternate the vocals, and with Randy, you get that kind of everyman persona that he brings to his singing. He was not, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, an incredibly gifted singer, and yet he has a very memorable voice and a very charming voice at points. That really comes across here, and it comes across so well in so many of their later hits. The final song is Thank You for the Feeling," written by Fred Turner, and this is a pretty good country rock tune, so they're ending on a relatively high note here. Unfortunately, 
Fred really overdoes it in the vocals, just doesn't need to crank it to 10 every time. And this is one of those examples, like I mentioned before, where whoever was handling the sliders should just have told him just to dial it back, less is more. It's got a great solo by Randy, a great tone too. At this point, however, as a listener, you're a little bit fatigued by the overall sludginess of the album. And, and they kind of rub it in by having a false ending and then restarting the song to fade out. And I was uh, perfectly happy to have it end the first time. So overall, this is not a great album, but it's an album in which you can hear the foundations for the great things to come. It's characterized by patchy songwriting, production which really is not bringing the best out of the band and is emphasizing one aspect of what would make them great at the expense of other aspects. So this is an interesting listen for anybody who's a fan of the band's later work, but I can't really give this more than three out of five.